Hi everybody, this is Michael here of Wild and Happy Travel and today we're going to be exploring Ireland. If you haven't done already, please like, subscribe and hit that notification bell. So let's get into our travel guide for Ireland. Ireland, or in the Gaelic language we call it Era, comes from an Irish goddess. So Ireland is located, of course, in the Atlantic Ocean, right on the edge of Europe. It is surrounded by water on all sides, from the Atlantic on its west coast to the Irish Sea on its east coast. And to make things complicated, Ireland isn't just Ireland. Of course, we have the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. In the Republic of Ireland, we have what we call 26 counties. In Northern Ireland, we have six. So in the total on the island of Ireland, we have 32 counties. In the Republic of Ireland, we have a population of approximately 5 million people. In Northern Ireland, there are approximately 1.8 million people. So approximately, we have 7 million people living on the island of Ireland. It is an island renowned for incredible historic and geological wonders. So segueing nicely into Ireland's past, we start with its geological history. Ireland, believe it or not, wasn't always where it is today. If I bring you back approximately 350 million years ago, you would have found Ireland beneath the equator. It would have been sunny, hot and not a drop of rain, which is unthinkable in Ireland today. So from 350 million years ago, we would have started to drift north and we've arrived where we are today. Moving to the other end of Ireland, in the northern section, you'll get to see one of the most spectacular rock formations you'll get in the world. That is the Giant's Causeway. Here you'll find 40,000 columns of basalt bursting out of the ground, formed through a slow volcanic eruption approximately 60 million years ago. These near-perfect hexagonal shaped columns will capture your mind's imagination, especially with the backdrop of the North Atlantic Ocean. So fast forwarding from 350 million years ago, and we'll take a look at something that in recent history shaped the landscape of Ireland. And that, of course, is glaciation. Approximately 12,000 years ago would have come to an end. This, of course, was during the last ice age. And Ireland at that time was beneath a sheet of ice, soaring one kilometer into the sky, if you can imagine. This ice, of course, would have receded. And by doing so, it would have shaped the landscape of Ireland from steep mountain valleys, dramatic cliffs and glistening lakes. This created the perfect landscape for early civilization, which nicely brings us into the history of humans in Ireland. It is believed that people arrived in Ireland approximately 8,000 BC. What these first people would have discovered was a land full of nature. And believe it or not, back then, Ireland was 95% covered in trees. They would have based themselves around the coastline, fishing and developing settlements. Of course, these settlements of people would have made their way inland and would have created some of the most beautiful places that you'll see in Ireland. They would have created spectacular settlements like Newgrange, which is a Stone Age passage tomb, which believe it or not, is older than the pyramids and Stonehenge. Then in approximately 2000 BC, we head into our Bronze Age. Bronze is made up of copper and tin, and you have great examples of copper mines right through Ireland. One of the most spectacular is in Killarney National Park on Ross Island. Still to this day on Ross Island, you can see the remnants of mining that went on 4,000 years ago. This copper, in conjunction with tin, would have traveled right throughout the Greek and Roman Empire in the disguise of medallions, necklaces, and coins. Then, of course, we come to the period where Ireland is most renowned for, and that is, of course, our Celtic heritage. The Celts would have arrived approximately 1500 BC. In their eyes, they would have discovered the perfect landscape for their settlements. An island full of rich agricultural land and a coastline teeming with fish. Moving on from our Celtic brothers, we would have had the arrival of Christianity. This would have happened in approximately the fifth century and had a huge impact on Ireland's history. These early Christian settlers would have sought out isolation so that they could find their God. Wonderful examples of these are, of course, the Skellig Islands, which are just off the coast of Kerry, the southwest of Ireland. You also have Inish Fallon Island on the lakes of Killarney and Clonmacnoise in County Offaly. 
In these isolated locations, these very monks would have started to document Irish history. And without these very monks, we would not have known a lot about our past. This is very much the golden age of literature in Ireland. We have great examples of that that you can experience from the Book of Kells. You also have a book called the Annals of Inish Fallon. However, you won't find that book here. You'd have to go to Oxford University in the United Kingdom. It is during this period we had the arrival of our Viking brothers. They would have hailed, of course, from Scandinavia and most notably Norway. What they came looking for was, of course, treasure, which they could bring to Valhalla and equally land full of rich agricultural promise. Our Viking brothers didn't last very long and what happened to them was they were integrated into the Irish way of life. Our Vikings brothers time was not very long in Ireland, approximately 300 years and it wasn't always harmonious. There would have been a lot of internal feuding between the Vikings, but equally with existing Irish clans, most notably with Brian Beru's family, which resided on the River Shannon, which is Ireland's longest river. Brian's family would have controlled the trade going up and down the River Shannon, and of course, they wanted to hold onto that and fought the Vikings in many a battle. In later years, Brian became known as the High King of Ireland. And he achieved something that nobody else achieved in our history, is that he united us. And in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014, he amassed the tribes of Ireland to fight against the new wave of Vikings coming in to our land. Moving on from our Viking brethren, we arrive to the year 1169, and that was the year of the Norman invasion. This invasion brought about great change in Ireland, from the construction of castles, but equally to many centuries of fighting and rebellion against the British occupation. Ireland was ruled by Britain for a number of centuries. Over the centuries of British rule in Ireland, there were many uprisings and rebellions. One of the most notable uprisings was in 1916, which is known as the Easter Rising. And this led to a war of independence and finally Ireland gaining its independence in the 1920s. Ireland officially didn't become a recognized country around the world until 1949, believe it or not. This independence was granted to only 26 counties, which form what we call the Republic of Ireland. And six counties, of course, remain in Northern Ireland or under British rule. Then finally, in 1949, Ireland became a recognized country in the eyes of the world, and it became known as the Republic of Ireland. Under this era of British rule, this was a particularly dark period for Ireland. This era of British rule led to repression, poverty, and sadly, many a famine. The most renowned was the Great Famine, which was from 1845 to 1852. Prior to 1845, Ireland had a population of approximately 8 million. In this period of 1845 to 1852, approximately 1.5 million people left this island and 1.5 million people died. It is known as a dark period in our history, and in the Gaelic language, it is known as Gorta Moor, which means the big hunger. After officially being recognized as a country in 1949, Ireland has decades of turmoil, but equally positive developments. One of the most significant was in 1998, when Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom signed what we call the Good Friday Agreement. This brought about great change in Northern Ireland and ultimately peace between the different communities. Nowadays, Ireland, both in the Republic and Northern Ireland, are thriving economies which cater very much for the tourism industry. So Ireland has an array of unique experiences for all interests. Here are some of my favorites. So I'd highly recommend, and it's one of my personal favorites, is to travel around the national parks of Ireland. You have six in total in Ireland. We'll start off with Glendalough in County Wicklow, and from there heading south down towards Killarney. Then we also have the Burn off the west coast of Ireland that is situated close to the Cliffs of Moher. Further west, we have Connemara National Park, absolutely spectacular location. Heading up north, we've got the Wild Niffin National Park. Above that, we have Donegal's Glenvey National Park. Each of our national parks is so unique in terms of its flora and fauna. By delving into each of these national parks, you'll get a real understanding of Ireland's past in terms of its geology and history. Next on my list, it will be to visit the Rock of Cashel. This is an incredible outcrop of limestone that sits in the Golden Vale in County Tipperary. It is home to very unique medieval buildings, and it's also the place where Brian Brew, if you remember him, the High King of Ireland, this is where he was crowned 
in 978. My recommendation is to take a visit inside the Rock of Cashel. Here you can find out about its unique history and who lived there and who conquered this amazing location. One of the most spectacular things you can do in Ireland is to take a kayaking trip on the lakes of Killarney. Here you can take a trip out to Inishvalan Island where monks settled in the 6th century. You can equally explore all the limestone caves and get to kayak through them which is absolutely amazing. You can take a tour from Ross Castle, which sits right on Loch Lane, which is the largest of three lakes in the National Park. It is a stunning location overlooking the mountains of Killarney. So if you're into hiking and you'd like to do something adventurous, then my recommendation would be Caran Tuchel. Caran Tuchel, or in the Gaelic language, Coran Tuchel, is the highest point in Ireland roughly speaking, 1,040 meters. While Caran Tool is not as high as most mountains in Europe and the world, it is still no easy hike. It is a spectacular mountain and region with so many different routes to go up and down this area. My recommendation would definitely be using a guide to get you up there because the weather can come in and change dramatically. Having a guide will give you the insight into the history, the geology and the folklore associated with this stunning region. A must do in any trip to Ireland in my opinion, is the Skellig Islands. The Skellig Islands are situated 12 kilometers off the southwest coast of Ireland. Why they are so important is they are the home of a 6th century settlement of early Christian monks. There are two main islands. One is called Skellig Michael, the other is called Skellig Bjug. On Skellig Michael is where the monks settled in the 6th century. On Skellig Michael, the largest of the Skellig Islands, you can get to see the beehive huts that the monks built over a thousand years ago. To get to see these incredible beehive huts, you'd have to take the Skellig landing trip, which lands on the island. Just be aware, climbing up to the top to see the beehive huts, you have to overcome 618 steep steps. It is definitely not a climb for the faint hearted and just be aware of your surroundings. If you prefer not to climb up 618 steps, don't worry, you can take another boat trip. That is called the Eco Boat Tour, which circumnavigates both the Skellig Michael and Skellig Bjug Islands. On Skellig Bjug, you'll get to see the second largest gannet colony in the world. An absolutely stunning bird, and approximately 30,000 pairs live on this island. And not to forget, of course, you get to see the puffin. This tiny bird, makes its home in Ireland and across Europe, and is an incredibly friendly bird with a colorful beak. If you're into wildlife like myself, then my recommendation would be to explore the marine life of Ireland. All around the coastline of Ireland, you'll find a variety of marine and wildlife tours. You can get to see spectacular creatures like the humpback whale, minke whale, common dolphins, the gray seal, and a multitude of birds. These include the gannets, shearwater, puffins, cormorants, and the majestic white-tailed seagull. Moving to the other end of Ireland, in the northern section, you'll get to see one of the most spectacular rock formations you'll get in the world. That is the Giant's Causeway. Here you'll find 40,000 columns of basalt bursting out of the ground. These near-perfect hexagonal shaped columns will capture your mind's imagination, especially with the backdrop of the North Atlantic Ocean. Throughout Ireland, there's a variety of hop-on, hop-off tours that you can do. Available in destinations like Dublin, Cork, Killarney, Galway and Belfast, these tours give you a very unique and easy way to discover these places. As the name suggests, a hop-on, hop-off experience allows you to hop off that bus and explore iconic areas of interest from monuments, museums, national parks. And when you finish at these locations, the perfect thing is you can hop back on that bus to continue your journey. What would you add into those experiences that I might not have mentioned? Let us know in the comment section below the best places to visit in Ireland. Where do I begin? Because to be honest, there are so many places that you could visit in Ireland. The only way I can do this is of course to give my personal recommendations. And to help you out, I'm gonna do it in a clockwise motion so that you can follow around Ireland. First on my list, of course, is Dublin. Dublin is the capital of Ireland and has a population of over 1.5 million. It is a great place to start on any tour of Ireland to discover its real historical importance and also its vibrant city. There are so many things to see in Dublin and it really depends on what your interests are. My favourites include Trinity College, of course, Kilmainham Jail, the GPO, which is known as our General Post Office, 
And if you fancy a nice little drink, why not take a visit to the Guinness Storehouse? Next on my recommendations is a visit to County Cork. It is the largest county in Ireland and it's also known as the Rebel County. My recommendation is to explore Cork City. It is a young, vibrant and bustling city with lots of music and entertainment and the River Lee running through the center of it. If you want to explore outside of Cork City, then my recommendation will be to head to Blarney. Blarney, of course, is home to the famous Blarney Stone. If you give this a kiss, you'll get the gift of the gab, meaning that you can persuade and smooth talk people into doing what you want them to do, a pure diva. If you're not into kissing the stone, and don't worry, it's not an obligation, you can visit Blarney Castle and Gardens an absolutely spectacular location. Blarney Castle was built over 600 years ago by one of Ireland's greatest chieftains, Cormac McCarthy. It's also home to a wonderful garden experience and the whole tour of the castle and gardens takes approximately two hours. Heading west of Blarney Castle, my next recommendation will be to visit Mizzenhead. And at this location, you'll find what we call the Mizzenhead Signal Station. You can take a tour of its interpretation center and equally a visit to the signal station. It takes approximately two hours to see all this with absolutely stunning views of the wild Atlantic Ocean. Heading north from Cork, we're gonna be heading to our next recommendation, and that is County Kerry. Known as the Kingdom of Kerry, it is one of the most beautiful counties you can visit in Ireland. There are so many beautiful places to visit in County Kerry, but my recommendation will be to visit Killarney, the Ring of Kerry, and Dingle. In each of these destinations, you can get to experience something so unique about County Kerry. From the national park and lakes in Killarney to the wild, rugged coastline of the Ring of Kerry. Still on our clockwise journey around Ireland, we head north again towards County Clare. From Kerry, you can either drive to Clare or take a ferry across from Tarbet and you'll arrive at a place called Killymere. Clare is known as the Banner County and it is home to some of the most renowned surfing spots in Ireland for example, La Hinch. It is also a famous location for Irish traditional music, which you can find right throughout the county, but especially in a place called Doolan. It is also home to one of Ireland's national parks, known as the Burn, a majestic karst-like landscape. You can't visit County Clare without taking a visit to the spectacular Cliffs of Moher. The Cliffs of Moher were formed over 300 million years ago, and they reach a height of over 200 meters. Heading north again, we come to my favorite city in Ireland, and that is Galway. Galway is known as the city of the triumphs, and it's the perfect place to experience culture, art, music, and fantastic food. Heading west out of Galway city, I'd head first to the Aran Islands. Here you can visit a number of islands, and one of the largest is Inish Moor. The island is an Irish speaking community, and it's also home to one of the most spectacular forts you're gonna see in Ireland, known as Dún Ingus. Coming back to the mainland, head west again to visit Connemara. Connemara isn't an actual town, it's a region of Ireland, and it's also home to one of Ireland's national parks. There's an array of things to do in Connemara, but one of my favorite places to visit is Killary Fjord, an absolutely stunning location where the Millery Mountains cascade down into this majestic fjord. Jumping north to Donegal, what is known as the Forgotten County. But in my eyes, it's the most unforgettable place you'll see in Ireland. While in Donegal, my recommendations will be to visit Schlieve League. What you'll find are some of the highest cliffs in Ireland. At over 600 meters, these breathtaking cliffs soar out of the Atlantic Ocean. And believe it or not, they are connected to the United States, to the Appalachian Mountains. Heading across into Northern Ireland, we come to the beautiful county of Antrim. In County Antrim, there's so many things to do, but my recommendation will be to visit the Giant's Causeway or take a hike along the Causeway coastline. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, you've got a huge amount of film locations in this county. And then lastly, my recommendation will be to head towards Belfast. In Belfast, what you'll see is a very vibrant city full of music, shops, great food. And my recommendation here will be to visit the Titanic Museum. It tells the whole history of the Titanic when it was built and what happened to the people on that ship. The Titanic, of course, was built in Belfast between the years 1909 and 1912 
before its maiden voyage in April of 1912. Lastly, one of my highlights of Belfast is to take what we call the Black Cab Tour. The Black Cab Tour experience gives you an incredible insight into the history of Northern Ireland and its troubles and equally the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Nowadays in Ireland, you'll find a wealth of different types of food to suit all taste buds. Whether you like fine dining in a restaurant or simply heading out to a pub to get the atmosphere, you'll find everything from meat dishes, seafood, vegetarian and vegan options. How do I get to Ireland? Getting to Ireland is pretty easy. There are a wide selection of airports that you can arrive at in Ireland, from Dublin, Cork, Shannon, Belfast, Knock, and even wee little Kerry has a small airport. The largest with the most daily flights, of course, is Dublin Airport. At any given airport in Ireland, you'll find car hire options along with public transport. Alternatively, if you don't want to fly to Ireland, you can take a ferry. You have a choice of arriving in Rosslair in Wexford or Dublin or Belfast. The most common way to get around Ireland is, of course, by car. This offers you the most flexibility in terms of going off the beaten track or relaxing in one location. Alternatively, you can take a bus, train, or domestic flights throughout Ireland. If you don't feel comfortable with driving on the left-hand side of the road, or you want more flexibility in terms of buses and trains, well then my recommendation would be to take a private guided tour of Ireland. This way you'll get the insight on history, folklore, and you also get to go off the beaten track. I will leave a link below for you on tours that you can do in a private capacity, in a group, or a self-guided experience. Ireland is considered a temperate climate, meaning you're going to get four seasons in one day. Don't come to Ireland for constant sunshine, but come for the beauty that comes with those four seasons. Summer tends to be a lot warmer than spring, autumn and winter. You'll get the occasional showers, but equally you'll get the long evenings in the summer months where it doesn't get dark until after 10 o'clock at night. Autumn tends to be a lot cooler with the occasional rainy days, but equally frosty, sunny mornings. Winter tends to be that little bit wilder where you'll have rain and wind and an occasional storm but that creates some of the most magical rainbows you're going to see in your life and finally we come to spring one of my favorite seasons in Ireland and that's because you get to see the flowers bursting out of the land as the sun warms Ireland up trying to pack for Ireland can be sometimes a little bit tricky and that's because of our four seasons in one day but here are my essentials number one definitely a rain jacket and trousers number two a warm fleecy top, or what we call in Ireland, a jumper. You might call it a jersey. Number three, good quality footwear. And especially if you're planning to be outdoors, I would definitely recommend a good hiking boot that gives you support around your ankles. Number four, if you're adventurous at heart and you like to swim, well, definitely bring a towel and suitable swimwear. Five, bring an adapter that's suitable for charging your phone or computer. In Ireland, we use the three pin plug, which is similar to the UK. What's the currency in Ireland? The currency in Ireland, of course, is the Euro. In most shop venues, restaurants, or visitor centers, you can use your credit card or you can use cash. Well, this is where we make it complicated for you. In the Republic of Ireland, we use the Euro. In Northern Ireland, they use Sterling. Just remember there are two separate currencies, so you will have to use the appropriate one in that area. If you prefer to use cash, right through Ireland and Northern Ireland, there are many ATM and banks where you can withdraw money. My advice is to carry a little bit of cash around you just in case the venue or the supplier that you go into doesn't accept card. Truthfully, in my eyes, there's no wrong time to visit Ireland. Each season will bring its unique beauty, and it really depends on what you want to experience in Ireland. If you're into adventure and you want to experience hiking, cycling, kayaking, then my recommendation will be to come in spring, summer, or autumn. Coming to Ireland in the winter time can be a little bit tricky in terms of finding accommodation, but there are places available. And that time of the year, you're gonna experience wild weather, beautiful rainbows, and incredible starry skies. The best time to visit Ireland, in my opinion, is spring and autumn. At these times, you'll have more accommodation available, with equally less crowds, and you'll get to experience a lot more of the real Ireland. Summer, on the other hand, tends to be a bit more crowded. It's the most popular time to come to Ireland, but equally just as beautiful, with a variety of accommodation venues and activities to do. So that's it, that's our travel guide to Ireland. So what about you? What would you add into this guide? Let us know in the comment section below. We love to hear your feedback. So until next time, be wild and be happy.